Hi, my name is Lisa Powers, and I'm on staff here at The Orchard. We want to welcome you to worship with us today. Orchard, and this is my family, my wife Yvonne, my son Noah, and my son Gabriel. We light this candle in hope. We light this candle with love. <coughs> we light this candle in joy. We light this candle in peace. A reading from Luke 1, 76 through 79. You, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people, by the forgiveness of their sins, by the tender mercy of God. The dawn on high will break upon us, the light to those who sit in the darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Reading from Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. 
Therefore, since we have been justified with faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Because God love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The word of the Lord. Isaiah, a prophet in the Old Testament, I call him the prophet of light, he declares the following, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Oh, those familiar words to us at Christmas time are words that speak of the light of Christmas having been promised, the light of Christmas having come, the light of Christmas now being held and beheld by two people who had waited their whole lives to see him. We're speaking of Simeon and Anna today. And before we look at that text a little more closely, let's have, offer a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Father, may the words of my mouth in the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight, Lord Jesus, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The grip of darkness is all around us, all the time. Darkness, in contrast to the light, is used in scripture to describe what life is like without God. Used some 200 times in scripture, darkness speaks to our tendency my tendency to choose my own way against God. But even in the dark, I look for ways to make my way forward. I'll, I'll turn on a little light on my phone. I'll, I'll stick my hands out. Even though my eyes are open, I can't see anything. I'll stick my hands out. Sometimes I'll, I'll put the fleshy part going backwards. And sometimes I even smack the back of my hard head as I walk into a dark scene. Darkness seems as though it's increasing. But like our eyes that adjust to the darkness, our lives adjust to the darkness as well. Christian author Kyle Adamant writes the following. An amber alert comes on the radio, but for us, it's just another drive to work. And the news reports another murder downtown as we lie on the couch, we grab another handful of chips. A fatal car accident has backed up the freeway we're frustrated because it's, because it's gonna make us late for dinner. A coworker is arrested for domestic violence or a teenager commits suicide. We're sad, but well, we've grown used to it. And it's not just that there's so much darkness out there. There's darkness in here as well. We don't like to admit it, but too often, we detect a darkness within ourselves. I detect a darkness within myself. I'll walk through life and I'll ask myself a question. Did, did I just really talk that way to my loved ones? Did, did I really just let my eyes watch that? Did I really cheat on that test? Did last night really happen? Where did, where did that thought come from? And we wonder about the darkness that's outside 
But the darkness within us is, is just as real. In fact, for many of us, it's deepening. We are hard-headed. We are hard-hearted people, walking in the dark, trying to find our way. The same was true of the people of God. As Isaiah writes and speaks of a light that has come, he obviously contrasts that with the darkness that the people were experiencing right then. That darkness was the threat of another nation coming and taking over the whole nation of Israel. The Assyrians to the north had too many times in the past sent their raiding parties down into Israel and taken over the land. And so the people are hearing about the rumors of war and they're concerned. And so what do they do? They don't go looking for the light. They dig deeper into the darkness. In fact, the context of the words that I've read to you today out of Isaiah chapter 9 have been translated this way by Eugene Peterson in his book, The Bible, we call it the message. This is how Peterson writes it. When people tell you, try out the fortune tellers, consult the spiritualists. Why not tap into the spirit world? Get in touch with the dead. Tell them, no, we're going to study the scriptures. People who try the other ways get nowhere, a dead end. Frustrated and famished, they try one thing after another. When nothing works out, they get angry, cursing first this God and then that one, looking this way and then that, up down sideways, seeing nothing, a blank wall, an empty hole. They end up in the dark with nothing. We look for light. We look for a way forward. And for the people in ancient Israel, and for us this day, God promises he will give a light, that the light will come, not by them seeking out fortune tellers and spiritualists, all of the ways that even today, we use to try and find our way. God will give light to his people. God will do what his people cannot. They themselves cannot turn on the light because they're in such deep, deep darkness. If there was a switch to flip, they couldn't even find it. The people who walked in darkness, Isaiah writes, have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. Listen as that light is described. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The majestic promise of the light of Christmas the great light having come to us from God the Father. Oh, we could wish and hope, pray, even plea with people to give up their dark ways of living. But I've heard the same pleas. I've heard the same requests. Still, there's days I'd rather live in the darkness. The story as we understand from Isaiah, from Isaiah 9 and 10, is that the people continued to walk in darkness. They liked the darkness better than the light. And specific to the siege and, and the threat of war coming from the Assyrian army, the region of Galilee where Isaiah was would very quickly become a desolate place of darkness. In the ancient world, when a foreign army would come in, they, they would level the grounds, so much so that they would just knock the walls down. They would knock the houses down. They, they would burn whatever wood they could find. And, and across the landscape or across the horizon, they, they would see these mounds where a city used to be. And, and what people remained that had been spared, their lives had been spared, they dared not start a fire at night in order to give away their location to the invading army. People thrown deeply into darkness. And their only, their only opportunity is just to grope about in the darkness, trying to find their way. The Israelite nation lived for centuries in that darkness with other rulers, the Assyrians and others, having taken over their land. God, though, our Heavenly Father, kept promising to them that a light would come, 
a light different than the sun or the moon, this light would be a person. And this person would come and bring the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God cannot be vanquished by any foreign army. The kingdom of God, Isaiah tells us, is one that is eternal. The throne cannot be overcome. And this kingdom of God will come with a child having been born, a son given to us. So as we read the story of the light of Christmas having come for us, there's two people in the story, Simeon and Anna. Now let, let's put the story into context. When Mary gave birth to Jesus, there was a Jewish law that said 40 days after she had given birth, she would have to come and present herself as having overcome, having healed up from the effects of childbirth. And so that she could uh, go through a rite of purification um, and, and could then enter back into the life of the Jewish faith. And Joseph is with her. They both come to go through that rite, that uh, fulfillment of the law. Jesus, their firstborn son, is also brought and he's redeemed. In other words, the scripture taught that the firstborn of whether a family or an animal, even the crops of the field belong to God. And so the families would come with their firstborn son and they would redeem that son. They would make a payment, usually two turtle doves, given in payment for the child. So Mary and Joseph come for the rite of purification and also to redeem Jesus, their firstborn. As they are entering into the temple, going through the rites of purification and redemption, this is what the scripture says of Simeon. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. His father and mother Mary and Joseph were amazed at what were being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed, and a sword will pierce your own soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. There was also a prophetess, Anna, a daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher, she was well along in years, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and was a widow for 40, 84 years. She did not leave the temple serving God night and day with fasting and prayers. At that very moment, she came up and began to thank God and to speak about him to Jesus, about all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. When they had completed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. The boy, Jesus, grew up and became strong, filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. Students of Scripture have identified a group of people among the ancient Jews. They have a name for them. They're called the Anavim. The Anavim are described as the poor ones who remained faithful to God in times of trouble. The Anavim were outliers of society, humble and expectant, waiting longing for the redeeming of God's people. I believe that Simeon and Anna, and most likely Mary and Joseph, were a part of that group, part of the Anavim. Listen again to Simeon's words. He says, Lord, now let you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation as you have prepared in the presence for, of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. You see, the Anavim understood 
that the light that God had promised would come into the darkness. And the darkness wasn't just over the nation of Israel. The darkness was over all of the earth for all people. And the light of Christmas sent by God the Father would come and would be for all people. Simeon, this older man, part of this group that was looking towards the redemption of Israel, begins to find life beating strong within him because he sees before his very eyes the promise he has heard from God the Father. The Spirit of God has prompted him to come into the temple because today, Simeon, you're going to see salvation. And so Simeon sees Jesus with Mary and Joseph. And I can imagine the scene in my mind's eye as Simeon is there and he kind of pushes his way to the front. Mary and Joseph are there to redeem their baby boy for the rite of purification. And here comes a stranger to them, Simeon. And, and he pushes his way through the people and takes the baby out of Mary's arms. And I don't know about you, but every mom I've ever met has been very defensive about strangers taking babies out of their arms. But still, Simeon comes and takes the baby out of Mary's arms. And he, and he holds Jesus. And he says, now, now I've seen the light and the deepest darkness. I have seen the light of God right before him. What can we learn from Simeon and from Anna? Like the other Anavim, Anna and Simeon were looking to God, not politics, not economics, nor to themselves. Each was a righteous and devout person. Both were obedient in what they knew about God, and God gave them more. Well, that's a lesson right there. If we're obedient to what God has given us right here, God will give us more, more of himself. They were people who were open to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Simeon and Anna took God at their word. They, they placed their trust in him. You see, Anna, this prophetess, she had been married as a young woman, married for seven years and then for 84 years. She's, she's an old lady. She's been in the temple all this time, it says, offering prayers, working there in the temple. And as a prophetess, she is a person filled by the Holy Spirit, not only to speak of God, but to, to see what God is doing. So as Simeon holds the baby Jesus, there in the grip of darkness, Simeon holds the light of God. And Anna comes and beholds her Savior. That grip of darkness was broken when the light of Christmas was held. So what does this story mean for us? Consider this. There's an often repeated experience when a baby is born. <laughs> At the birth of a baby, everybody, doctors, nurses, family members, everybody becomes an anatomy inspector. Oh, don't go too far with that. An anatomy inspector because they come and they check out and they say, are all the parts and pieces in the right place? We become baby inspectors. We're counting how many fingers, how many toes. And at some point, we extend a hand, maybe just a finger, into the very small palm of the child. And the child grips a hold of our finger. And we say, oh, he's got a good grip. Oh, she's got a strong, firm hand. And for a moment, we feel the touch of the small hand connecting, holding, gripping us. Simeon held Jesus. But his words tell me that Simeon understood the grip of grace was now around his life. Anna had waited a lifetime to see her savior. No longer would redemption elude her grasp. Redemption was right before her and the baby held in Simeon's arms. 
So what can we learn from this story? Isaiah speaks of a people living in darkness, God sending the light. Simeon and Anna had lived their whole long lives waiting for that light to come. And when Jesus is brought into the temple by Joseph and Mary, Simeon breaks out in song. He says, now I can die. I've seen my salvation. Anna rushes into the scene and she beholds the redemption that she has longed for, for year after year after year. So how is it for you? Are you a person walking in darkness, afraid to hit your hard head? Or, or will you be a person like Simeon and Anna, waiting for the light? And when the light comes, will you embrace it? Will you hold it? Will you receive it? Will you be as Simeon was, able to say, you know, I, I'm, I'm ready to die because I have seen in Jesus my salvation. And now I discover the one I am holding is, a hold, is holding onto me, held firmly in the grip of his grace, the light of Christmas for Simeon, the light of Christmas for Anna, the light of Christmas for you has come. Will you give yourself over to being held in the grip of Jesus' grace this Christmas season. Lord Jesus, thank you that you have given of yourself that we might experience the Father's light and life, his mercy, his love in our world right here, in a world that seems to be getting darker and darker by the moment. So, Lord Jesus, light of Christmas, come, illumine the world around us. Come, shed your light into our lives. And Lord, let us be gripped by your grace and held by you. And together, God's people said, amen, amen. heard the story of the light of Christmas held and be held. I encourage you as you go out into a world that is dark, 
understand that the light is within you and the light is, is meant to shine out of your life. One of the ways that you can let that light shine out of your life is to invite your friends. Come to our Christmas Eve services. We're having three this year, five, seven, and 11. These will be candlelight services as we will finish each service by lifting those candles high, singing Silent Night, Holy Night. Invite your friends to come and be a part of it. And I'm going to ask, in fact, recommend that if you plan on coming to the Christmas Eve services, plan on wearing a mask. I think it'll be best for all of us. Go now in his name, the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus, amen.